Okay, hi. Um, my name is Tom Christie. No, let me start again. Buongiorno. And thank you so much to the organizers of this wonderful con uh, conference in this beautiful, beautiful city of Firenze. Uh, my name is Tom Christie. I'm a Django core developer and the author of Django REST framework. Um, I'm fortunate enough that to be in a position where I'm currently working on open source full time as a result of a collaborative funding model for Django REST framework. If you work in a company that uses Django REST Framework in some capacity and you don't yet fund it, I'd strongly urge you to talk to the owners of the company about getting involved in, in the funding, um, finding ways to enable financially sustainable open source development is really, really important, both for our community and also for our industry. Okay? So, Today, unusually, I'd like to talk to you not about Django REST framework, but instead about some ideas that I've been thinking about and starting to work on about how we might take a slightly fresh approach to API frameworks in general. So, this is the more verbose title of the talk. I thought I'd run with the shorter one. What I'm going to do during this talk, I'm going to propose a couple of changes that we could make to how we think about the interface that the framework exposes, walk through those step by step, and then demonstrate the value that making those changes would give to us. Now, this has all um, come about as a result of my work on Django REST framework and thinking about different ways that we can build in the sorts of functionality that Django REST Framework provides. Things that I'm particularly interested in here are uh, browsable web APIs, uh, interactive API documentation, and dynamic client libraries. So I want to show ways that we can build those sorts of things and do that in a way that's actually a bit more elegant than how Django REST Framework currently works. To do this, I'm going to need the help of uh, a little API that we're going to work through. It's got two very simple functions, our lovely Kitten API. One of those functions that it's going to provide to the users is the ability to add a kitten to your favorites list. You give it a kitten name, and it will add it to your saved list of I totally love this kitten. It's so cute. Um, and the other bit of functionality that our service is going to provide is the ability to show the kittens in our favorites list, optionally filtering that list down to just including kittens of a particular fur color. OK, so um, don't get too hung up on the details of this, but here is a function-based view demonstrating how those two bits of functionality might look in a Django project. We're not going to talk about class-based views today. That would just be a diversion. So I'm really only interested in discussing today about how all this would apply to function-based views. And what we've got at the moment <clears throat> is all of our functionality is bundled up in this one view function that takes a request and returns a response. And the first very simple change that I'm going to propose in this step of things is that we could consider splitting out the two different bits of functionality that this view currently provides, because it has two distinct thing cases that it handles. So I would like to start by proposing, well, what about we think about splitting up the individual request methods into separate view handlers? OK. So in the first case, in our URL conf, we would have a single entry in our URL conf. This is kind of pseudocode, I guess, pointing all requests going to kittensfav at a single function. In the second case, 
we're splitting up requests by their request method into these two different functions. Now, what does that give us? So what that gives us is the code that we've built in the second case is exposing more information. So if we wanted to, say, build um, automatic API documentation tools, we have more information at our fingertips by inspecting the code about what bits of functionality the code is going to provide to the user. So in the first case, this is the only information we have available to our automatic documentation generator. In the second case, we've got two distinct functions, two distinct bits of functionality, two doc strings that we can pull out, and we've got more information available for us in how we would generate the documentation for our users. Now, the, um, the next step that we're going to take, something a bit more substantial than that. So that's a very simple first thing that we could do. <clears throat> so the primary interface for handling incoming stuff in Django and in most other uh, web frameworks is the request response interface. You define a function that takes an incoming HTTP request, some other kind, yes, an incoming HTTP request, and returns a response at the, at the other side. Now, actually, that's a little bit lacking in information about what functionality this view provides. And what would be nice would be if the signature of our view could reflect um, more fundamentally the functionality that it's providing. So in the case of add a favorite kitten, what we've got is something that we'd like to call with who is it who's doing this operation and what's the name of the kitten that they want to add to their favorites list? And once you've got those two parameters, that's everything that you need in order to affect that action. Uh, similarly, it would be nice if rather than returning HTTP responses from these functions, we were able to return plain data from the functions. Okay, so in the first case, we're returning an HTTP response there. And it would be nice to just be able to return the data as is. Because at that point, you've got a function that's more fundamentally expressing uh, the intent of the action. It's, it's more reusable as well. You could use these uh, views from one inside the other, which is difficult to do if you're inside a request response cycle. Um, now, there is a, a nice pattern, for do a well-established pattern for dealing with this sort of style called dependency injection. And there's one example, one really good example in the Python ecosystem at the moment is the PyTest framework. So PyTest uses dependency injection for the parameters of its test functions. And what you see all over in PyTest code is functions that look like this that have some named parameters that somehow magically are provided to the test at the point that it runs by the framework itself. Now, we're, all, we're talking all about how we can build more meaning into our code base in order to be able to leverage that in tooling. So, Oh, and here's, here's how that looks in uh, PyTest. So you declare fixtures, which are the methods of building up those parameters. All right. uh, we're, we're talking all about how to build more meaning into our interfaces here. So let's start thinking about type annotation in Python. Well, here's a view function that we've added Python 3's type annotation to. So you can see we've explicitly declared 
this function takes a uh, an instance of the request class and returns an instance of the response class. And you can use static type checkers on that and blah, blah, blah. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yes. So what about rather than using PyTest's style of the name of the parameter is the thing that determines how the framework figures out how it gets built. Instead, you could use this pattern of having the class annotations be the thing that describes how that parameter is going to get provided by the framework, and in fact have the class itself be the thing that describes how it gets built and how it gets passed to the view function. And we can do that both for the parameters of our views, and we could also do something similar for the response that we return from the view. So rather than necessarily returning an HTTP response, we could declare that we want to return some primitive data from our view, OK? And as I've been saying, the, the classes themselves would be responsible for how they get instantiated, and the framework would then handle instantiating those classes and passing them over to the view. And the declarations of how those components get built could themselves include other component dependencies. So in this instance, we're showing um, I'd better speed up. OK, anyway, so here's what uh, one of our, our views. Our, our views can, can use multiple, of the, multiple numbers of these type-injected parameters, and they can use it in the response as well. So, and once you start doing that, Request response is no longer even the most fundamental level that you could be working at. In fact, it's just one of many different abstraction levels that you could be at. And that could be request response. It could be get the raw WSGI environment or, and return the WSGI response. Or it could be an ASCII interface. Or So very, very flexible approach. Now let's go back to Kitten API. Uh, 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 uh. This is what our Kitten API now looks like after we have started to type annotate it. And you can see that what we're doing is we're building more and more information into our view functions. Um, <clears throat> they, because the functions that we're exposing have a more fundamental, into, uh, a more an interface that more fundamentally expresses their intent, they're a little bit cleaner to test because you can call them directly with the information that you actually mean to be acting on rather than building up a mock request and decoding a response. <clears throat> OK, the second, the second of the two big changes that I propose here. So let's take a moment to quickly talk about JSON schema. What's JSON schema? JSON schema is a document format for expressing data structures and the constraints on data structures. It gets really widely used in API description languages such as Swagger, where it's used both to document the types of parameters and the constraints on those types of those parameters to the API, and also to declare what you, the user should expect the API response will look like. Um, it's quite expressive. It enables you to describe both primitive types, more complex types, composite types. It, it has a union, so you can say, a data structure will be either this style or that style. We'll take a quick look at some of the examples of how JSON schema looks. It's a really widely used format, uh, very interoperable. It has these nice properties of meaning that you can do things like ensure that some of your <laughs> client-side validation is exactly the same as your server-side validation. 
Uh, it allows you to use tooling like build HTML forms that correspond with the input. So for example, if you have an enum, being able to use a drop down select for that enum or some other appropriate HTML control for them. Um, <clears throat> and you can build up composite types with it as well. So it's quite expressive, really widely used, a really good interoperable way of being able to describe what your data structures look like. So how can we make use of this? Nearly. Better. Well, what about if we use Python's classes and have a class structure that mirrors what JSON's schema provides and mirrors the same set of capabilities? Well, if we built that, we'd be able to have data primitives that express themselves as JSON schema that you can use in the same way as basic primitive data types. And that would handle validation of that data for you. So if you have an instance of one of these classes, you know that that instance uh, v is valid within the constraints of the data structure as it's being expressed. And we'd be able to build up composite objects of these sorts of things. <coughs> And those composite objects would also respect the schema validation of the object as a whole. And the nice thing is, once you've got that, you can start using those in type annotations. You can start using those in type annotations both for the parameters of a function and for the response types of the parameters. And if you're using static type checking, then you're also guaranteed that your incoming data and the stuff that's going out meets your schema constraints. So that's going to give us all, all these really nice properties of being able to um, <clears throat> take advantage of all the tooling that JSON's schema already has available to it. Things like being able to build HTML forms that I've talked briefly about, or create a Swagger document for our API that is a machine-readable documentation format for the API as a whole. <clears throat> Let's get back to Kitten API. So you can see, as things stand at the moment, we have some parameters that reflect the request and components of the request and the response directly. What we're going to do now is declare our schema constraints, the, the set of different data types that we want to be working with, and then use those in, in place of some of the other elements that we were using before, and have the framework be responsible for handling, well, in this case, kitten color is going to map onto a query parameter. Okay? <clears throat> so, we talked a lot about what we're going to do. Let's talk about what the benefits of taking this approach are. We've got all of this rich information that we've built into our interfaces. We're able to use code introspection to bring all, that, all of that information back out and into our tooling. We've got uh, the schema constraints on our functionality. So let's have a look. The first thing, API mocking. So by the time that we have declared our views, let's say we've declared our views, but we haven't written any logic inside those views at all. All we've done is we've described the schema constraints, we've put the parameters in on the views, and we've wired up the URL conf, but we haven't written anything that actually does anything or accesses the database. Well, we already have enough information at that point for the framework to be able to provide a mock API for us and for the framework to be able to start running an API that satisfies those constraints 
and returns, say, some slightly randomized data that fits within the constraints of what it knows the API is supposed to return, and returns errors when the user sends incorrect stuff at it. And having a mock API available is really valuable because you're able to have your team start working on the design, the raw design of the API without thinking too much about the implementation and get that up and into production and have your front end team start working against that reference, really, that live reference case that's up there and running. And it promotes this design first way of thinking about your API. The next thing that it's given us is it's given us enough information at this point to be able to provide the sort of web browsable APIs that REST Framework gives us, in particular the controls that, the, um, that each page should display, whether it's a get or a post, and to be able to provide a nice uh, form modal that corresponds with the input parameters in each case. Um, a bit more substantially, it gives us enough to generate interactive API documentation, such as the stuff that's just landed in the latest version of Django REST framework. And <clears throat> in, each of the, in each of the different views, we'll be able to describe to the user um, documentation that we've pulled out of the schema doc string or information that we've pulled out of the doc string of the function itself. And the great thing about that is the documentation is absolutely guaranteed to be in sync with the implementation because the implementation describes how the documentation is built for you. Uh, and it's, it's much more elegant than how REST Framework currently builds the API documentation. That involves a lot of very gnarly introspection. It doesn't always work properly in all cases and so on. Dynamic client libraries. Um, so once you have a complete API schema, uh, in something like Swagger or CoreJSON or RAML, you're able to build client libraries that you can use to interact with that API uh, with an interface that more uh, reflects the intent of what functions are being called rather than making HTTP requests and HTTP responses. We've already built a JavaScript, a Python, and a command line version of each of these. Um, <clears throat> Here's a, a bit of an example of what the command line version interacting with our kittens API might look like. And you can see it's a more natural way of interacting with the interface than uh, building HTTP requests directly. And all of this information is available to the client because the API is able to expose a scheme, an API schema that describes how the client, what actions the client is able to take. Uh, command line, ah, yes. <clears throat> so we're no longer routing requests and returning responses, which means we're able to also route other kinds of things to our view as well as HTTP routing. <clears throat> One of those things would be to route management functions to our view and have the framework be responsible for saying, okay, if you're routing commands to our view, then I'm going to pull out stuff from the command line and pass those in as parameters rather than pull out stuff from the body of an HTTP request, say. That might look something like this. And that's just a really nice, elegant way of being able to map management functions onto the same sort of set of functionality that your view functions already provide. Okay? Um, more interestingly, more work, but more interestingly, there's also the possibility of routing non-HTTP network stuff onto your view. So for instance, with real-time APIs, say WebSockets, um, <clears throat> you now have the, the potential, at least, to be able to route that sort of network traffic to the same view because the interface is no longer constrained to be talking about HTTP in particular. Um, in that case, we've got a bit more work to do. We're going to route the incoming request off to the view. We'll run the view. We'll return the response down to the client. We'll keep that open. And there then needs to be some kind of mechanism for the framework knowing about when has that thing been updated. When it's updated, it will run the view again, take the diff of the last thing it sent and the one it's now sent, send that down to the client. And that way, what you have is 
views that you can map the same WebSocket route uh, onto an HTTP route that you also have and have a live view onto what that function returns rather than a once-off. <coughs> so, yep, all about build, how we can build rich information into our fundamental interface that the, the framework provides for us. Um, the two big changes being the, the type annotation and the tying in uh, JSON schema to that type annotation to give you uh, something that is really e easy to leverage into all of these wonderful, wonderful bits of functionality that give so much value to your users and users of your API. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's about that. So I've started doing some work on this, some concrete work on this. Um, I've got some ideas about how it might tie back into Django REST framework uh, or Django in the longer term. To start with, I'm working on it as a fresh project, and some of those ideas are a little bit open-ended, so we'll see exactly where that goes. And I think that that's all that I have to say today. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>